Town of the Skin Man, written by Minister of Owls. When I look back on what I saw back there, in that small town, all I feel is numb. What else can you feel in the face of such horror? The case I'm about to present before you is disturbing. It's not a pleasant story, and certainly not for those with weak hearts and stomachs. But it is a story that needs to be told. It all began in the woods surrounding a small town about a month ago. It was in these woods that the first victim was found, a man named Tom Grady. His body was found naked, his face skinned off. The police's main suspicions were on a crazy drug-fueled murder of some sort, or maybe a regular drug-fueled naked run through the woods that ended in a meeting with a bear. Extraordinary, but simple when you looked at it. That was until they checked the contents of his stomach. The coroner, a solid man by any standard, had to get out of the room to vomit into a trash can. They found his face in his stomach. The main theory shifted again. The man was drugged and did what he did on drugs. That one lasted as long as a month before the forensics report came back. The man was as clean as a teddy bear. Just crazy then. It couldn't be anything else. And then it happened again. Two bodies together in the woods. A man and a woman, naked, their faces skinned. At least this time, the coroner didn't vomit when he pulled out their half-digested faces from their digestive tracts. Nor were there any theories for the negative test results to dash. Only blind confusion. It happened again. A kid, 15 years old, naked in the woods. And then again, even younger, a 13-year-old. And it kept happening. Every couple of days, a new victim would be found in the woods. A figure started forming when the local newspaper printed the first sighting of the skin man. An old photo, black and white, with just one small caution written on it. Taken in the woods, it said. It was poorly lit, showing a figure among the trees. At first glance, naked. His head was blank. Then, as your eyes adjusted, you could see it clearer. From the neck down, his whole body was covered in face after face, all stitched together to form clothing. From this, a legend started to grow. The skin man was a demonic spirit that lived in the woods, that lured people into the woods and made them mutilate themselves. The whole thing was horrific, nasty, and none of my business. I wouldn't have bothered with these urban legends and skinnings at all. At least, not until I got a phone call from an old college friend named John. The skin man had taken his eight-year-old son. Now, I was on the extremely shady side of the PI business. None of my friends ever wanted me to work for them, even if I offered so I knew that he was calling me out of sheer desperation. I arrived in the town the next day. His household had held up incredibly well after the death. His wife sought comfort from a support group on social media. Tom Grady had been an active member of the group, so the whole community was mourning together. John had a friend on the police force, the coroner who performed the autopsy. He was how I got the vomit story. He's a great guy. Together, I and the coroner made a promise to John. I would do anything and everything in my power to find out who or what was behind this. I would do anything, legal or not. The coroner would do as much as he could to point his colleagues in the direction that I'd give them. We swore an oath in his son's bedroom. It took me three months to scrounge everything I needed. At the end of it, I called John and his police friend over. I was surprised to see the coroner arrive first while John was the one who was late, by a whole hour. I'm sorry I'm late, 
I was with my wife trying to find her phone. She lost it someplace. I waved it off. We'll talk later. I soft it. I motioned then for them to follow me, and I led them to my living room where I had set up my projector. I want you to know one thing. None of this is legally admissible in a court. The only thing you'll get out of watching this is you'll know exactly what happened in this town. I saw no rejection in their eyes, only grim acceptance. I turned on the projector. On the screen, it showed a young girl in a bedroom, lying on a bed. The lights were off, and the only illumination came from a window peering outside. John twitched. That's my neighbor's daughter. Yes, I said. I stole the tape from her parents. John had a disgusted look now and moved as if to block the projector, but I pointed to the screen. Look at the window, I said. The light coming through her window came from another window. It came from a lamp shining upon another bedroom. John stepped back as recognition clicked in his head. It was his son's bedroom. The very night that he had disappeared, he was right there, lying in his bed. Through the girl's window, we could see everything. For a few moments, we sat together in silence, watching the child as the moment of reckoning drew nearer. Then we heard a loud screeching noise. It was hard to make out what it was due to heavy distortion. For a few seconds more, nothing happened. Then the bedroom doorknob turned and opened, revealing a silhouette of a humanoid figure standing in the hallway. It marched forwards to his son's bed, hands reaching for him. It crossed the lamplight, and I heard a gasp from beside me as the face of John's wife emerged from the darkness. As we watched, she grabbed her son's shoulders and shook him awake, then she whispered something into his ear and took him into her arms. As she carried him down the stairs, the screeching noise started again. It was still distorted, but now clear enough to be identified as the sound of a car revving up. I paused the tape. John was frozen, just staring blankly at the screen. Good. Frozen was just how I needed him. Otherwise, he might have punched me for what I did next. I took out a phone, John's wife's phone. You see, I told you that I was shady. As I punched in her password and accessed her group on social media, I pulled up her messages and connected to the projector and cast it on the screen. And then, the real story started. The story of a cancer that had been growing in this closed town the cancer that hid under the skin of a support group. The chat showed the slow degradation of a group into a cult. No, no, not a cult. A cult takes passion. No, what these people had was an intense apathy to human life. Originally, the purpose of the parent support group had been to be just that. A place for parents to vent and be comforted, over the course of several months, the support had been becoming more and more derailed. More posts started showing up about how ungrateful their kids were, how much of their lives the parents had to give to raise them, how their kids were forming gangs. They couldn't have raised kids such as these, could they? Slowly, a growing belief was starting to spread among the members that their children were cursed, born evil. It was here that the skin man was really born. It was Sean Theron who dug up the old tale. The skin man was an ominous figure from an old wives tale, a dark influencer who wanted discord and whispered dark things to their children. It corrupted them until their souls ran black, and then it led them to skin their parents alive. Maybe it was supposed to be a joke at first. Ooh, the skin man, 
he was the real reason that the town's kids were so rotten. Ooh, the skin man. What other sensible reason was there? None. It was the only reasonable explanation. People started talking about how they sometimes thought their children would spend too much time talking to themselves in their room. How they thought they might have heard someone talking back. And then, one day, it stopped being a joke anymore. A tale came from the city of a boy who had killed his own father. The group was aflame. How could they stand by and watch this dark figure destroy their world? How could no one else do anything when the evidence was so strong? When it was all so obvious, the skin man was doing it. They had to do something, and it had to be outside the system. Because the skin man might have gotten to everyone else. Tom Grady, an ardent supporter of the original purpose of the group, was going to shut the whole thing down. He offered a desperate plea to the mob, asking them, begging them to come to their senses. That didn't go down well with them. After all, if you couldn't see that the skin man had to be stopped, you were either getting in the way or worse, actively supporting him. Once again, it was Sean Theron who started it. He privately messaged everyone in the group, begging them to take action against this dark figure that was ruining their lives. Tom was practically a follower of the skin man. By opposing the group, it was kill or be killed. So... They grabbed him. He was their first victim. Their experiment to finalize their methods. But the stomach. Once you dismiss the impossible, only the possible, no matter how horrific it may be, remains. Tom was force-fed his own skin. The group was ecstatic. Celebrations all around. True justice, justice the system would never understand. Victory against the skin man. John's wife sent more than a few flirty messages to the hero, Sean. From there, the horrific crusade continued. Parents were given the duty of purifying their children, and so they did. Their children weren't really their children. They were demons sent by that cursed figure. Demons that had eaten their real children and would soon come to torture them. It was self-defense against a greater evil. Vengeance against the skin man. And that was that. John had dropped to the floor now, kneeling his eyes still staring away at nothing. We helped him to his feet and accompanied him to his home, where we left him, sitting in silence in his living room. From that day on, the very structure of the investigation changed. Instead of searching for a single killer, the focus turned on the parents. And then, the results came rushing in. Dozens arrested in the first week. John's wife was one of the first. It should have been the biggest story of our time, but it isn't. The story hasn't spread at all. Sean Theron was the editor of the newspaper. There was absolutely nothing found against him, not even on the Grady case. I don't know how a guy like that is so clean but he's still free now. He's free to run his pen all over the morning news. All the people of this little town know now is that the skeptics and the pig-headed police are now arresting ordinary people for the crimes of the dreaded skin man. His daughter hasn't disappeared. 
yet. Despite my very presence there putting me at risk, I managed to get a message through to his wife. Recently, the newspaper has turned against her, openly calling her a whore and a liar. I hope to God that she gets custody. A heavy fear hangs on me that I won't be able to enter the town again. John's been at the police station protesting night and day that his wife is innocent. He's talking about possession and shape-shifting. He believes in the skin man. Recently, not one hour ago, I got a text from my police friend. It was about John's wife. She's now saying that the skin man made her do it.